Well, hi everybody, and welcome to the Deanery Garden for this week's sermon. I didn't think it was very fair to expect anyone else to read that passage from Nehemiah this morning with all those names of people who helped rebuild the walls. The whole of chapter 3 lists nothing but names, and I only read 13 out of 32 verses. And frankly, the reason I cut it short was that the second half was much harder to pronounce uh, than the first. Like most clergy, I have a lot of books on the books of the Old Testament, which are uh, commentaries on the text. And every single one of them glosses over chapter 3 with just a few passing words. No one, it seems, is particularly interested in a list of names of who built the wall. And you're probably wondering why on earth James and I chose that chapter to be part of this series. But here's the big question for you. Were you listening intently enough to spot that one of the people who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem was a perfume maker. Now that's really important and I'll come on to that in just a moment. But we are in the middle of a series on the book of Nehemiah, this little gem that's squeezed into the Old Testament uh, just before the Psalms. And our series is called Renew, Restore and Rebuild. Nehemiah leads the people of Judah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem following their destruction by the Babylonians in about 586 BC. And he travels back to Jerusalem, having been born in captivity, to do it. We've learnt that Nehemiah saw that he could be part of the solution and not part of the problem. We learnt that he prayed before he undertook any action. That's a theme underlying his work. And praying and waiting, of course, go hand in hand. We've learnt that he had to overcome his fears and take risks if he was going to do what God asked of him. And that he needed to plan and consider what was really important and lay all the other stuff to one side. And I apologise for the sound of scaffolding poles. That's just a reality in this part of St Helier at the moment. We've noticed some common themes with the catastrophe that overtook the people of Jerusalem and their renewal as God's people with the rebuilding of the wars and the global pandemic that we have all experienced and the renewing of our church and us as individuals as we emerge from it. What will be our priorities as a church? What fears do we need to overcome as we seek to look ahead to what it will mean to be church in this world in which we find ourselves with all the challenges we're going to face in the coming months. Well, chapter 3 and its list of names gives us some key principles for what it means to be church post-COVID-19. And here are those principles. So principle number one, the perfume maker helped build the walls. Now, don't underestimate the importance of that. And actually, if you read chapter 3, look at who was involved. There were high priests, there were Levites, there were men from all over the region, including Jericho, which was 20 plus miles away. Whatever they did in Jerusalem would have no direct benefit to Jericho. There were goldsmiths. Imagine how a goldsmith's hands would react to clearing rubble. In one of the verses we didn't read, there was a man called Baruch who zealously repaired a section. Well, there's always one really enthusiastic person, isn't there, who uh, cheers along the others. And what a great gift that is, encouragement and enthusiasm. In fact, the only people who didn't join in, according to Nehemiah, were some nobles who refused to take orders from anyone. And that's my next principle. Paul says in Romans 12, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. And actually, I have to say, it's rather sobering to know that in two and a half thousand years or so since Nehemiah rebuilt the walls, human nature hasn't really changed very much. But one of the things that I've said repeatedly in our series on Nehemiah is to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. When Paul said those challenging words from Romans, he was talking about us being living sacrifices, offering our whole selves to God each day. As someone once wryly said, 
uh, the trouble with living sacrifices is that they keep crawling off the altar. My next principle in being God's people in a post-Covid-19 world takes me to two characters in chapter 3. Jedi, son of Haramath, made repairs opposite his house, and Hattush, son of Hashabani, made repairs opposite his. Now, God's church, we have discovered during lockdown, is not about buildings at all. Now, of course, we love her and cherish our church building, but that doesn't define us. Being God's people is about taking the gifts we have and using them wherever we happen to be, in our places of work, opposite our homes, in our homes, praying for those around us. I mean, let me give you an example. When was the last time you prayed for your neighbour? if you know who he or she is. It's also about doing things where they may have no direct benefit to us, like the men of Jericho. It is servant ministry in a largely thankless world. And it isn't about grand gestures, it's the small day-to-day -day stuff, right in the environment which we inhabit daily, where the differences are made. It's about thinking with a Christian mind, including God in our daily decision-making and ensuring that our faith is out there, building God's kingdom opposite our home. And as we look to restructure ourselves as God's people post-COVID-19, every single one of you can make a difference. That's why we had that reading from Corinthians. Through your prayers, through your action, through your giving, through your discipleship to build up the body of Christ. So please think about the way that you can be disciples in the place right outside your house, perhaps both literally and metaphorically. Find a place to serve and get on with it. Nehemiah even tells us that Shalom's daughters uh, joined in the rebuilding. And that tells us that everyone was dedicated to the task. It wasn't just a, a hobby or something to do because you haven't found a better offer somewhere else. The people of God were dedicated. And the final thing I want to say about chapter 3 is the very fact that most commentators skim over it. I've skimmed over it in the past. I've done sermon series on Nehemiah and away days for church groups and I have never bothered to read chapter 3 before this series. And we make assumptions, don't we? Sometimes without really investigating something more fully. I did that about this chapter. I assume it had nothing to say to us. But then I began to look more carefully. And of course, Nehemiah included all those names for a reason. In our world at the moment, it's easy to make assumptions about people, events, motives. We assume we know what people are thinking or what they're like because of the colour of their skin or which service they prefer or how much money they do or don't have. Nehemiah chapter 3 reminds us that detail matters when it comes to people. Don't make assumptions. Instead, look carefully at people's actions, including our own. We all have a part to play. Over the next few weeks as we approach the autumn and some kind of return to normality, please think very seriously about where God is calling you to renew, restore, and rebuild. Let's pray together, shall we, amidst the banging of scaffolding. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you call each one of us to be part of the body of Christ, to build up your kingdom here on earth. We thank you, Lord, for this amazing passage from Nehemiah chapter 3, and the fact that we remember those names today and that they're recorded in the scriptures uh, tells us that everybody had a gift to offer. Help us, Lord, as we go out into this coming week to be your disciples, to rebuild your walls opposite our hopes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.